All right. Well, the time's a couple of minutes after 6 p.m. My name is William Berg. Uh, I'm a historian. I'm doing this on my own. Historian is what I do for a living, but Sacramento history is essentially a hobby. And I guess I've gotten enough attention for that that uh, people recognize who I am or, or recognize my books. And so the natural question after that is, well, okay, why is a white guy writing about black history or talking about black history? Well, partially, uh, my assumption is that white privilege is a thing. And being a middle-aged white guy, I have some. And the only ethical use of white privilege is destroying white privilege. So what I plan to do here is take a little chisel to white privilege in history by reasserting the diversity of Sacramento's history and providing talks focused on underrepresented communities that are part of a greater whole. Sacramento history doesn't really make sense if communities of color are excluded and black history is a very important component of that as we talked about last time. It's part of what makes American politics, California politics, Sacramento politics make sense because the politics of slavery, the politics of race, the politics of the early Republican Party were inextricable from the history of Sacramento. And so that filling in the gap does part of it. Now I realize that by discussing black history, I'm explicitly, I'm entering black space. And while I'm in that space, I have a responsibility to be as humble and as cautious as I can. And if I step over that line, I, I fully expect to have it <laughs> pointed out to me. But I want to get close to that line because I want to show what's I've found the what I found is not unique. Uh, this is not a discovery because these are things that people knew. These are things that people experienced. They're, these are family stories and community history that previous historians and researchers have uncovered over the years. Most of the photos that you're going to see this evening from the Center for Sacramento History, Sacramento Public Library, California State University, Sacramento, with some from the California State Library, and the principal documentary source that I've used is from, well, there are a variety of sources, mostly newspapers, and uh, Clarence Caesar's A Historical Overview of Sacramento Black Community, 1850 to 1980, his master's thesis, is a source that I turn to again and again. But it's become something to build on. Now, last time, we left the city of Sacramento on October 22nd, 1879, with the march of President Ulysses S. Grant down K Street. And this grand prog progression included local militias, including, as I mentioned, the Sacramento Zoos, Sacramento's Black Militia, which was more than a militia organization. They were also a get out the vote organization. And Sacramento's African American community, after the struggles of the 1850s, the gold rush, and the period of civil war, felt like things were getting better. The right to vote, the right to, to be able to testify in court, to receive public education, and most importantly, the right to not be enslaved by merit of race had been delivered upon, not through the benevolence of whites, but through the activism of the African-American community and uh, a lot of work. And it seemed like things were going to get better then as, as the optimism in Sacramento was pretty high. Sacramento at the time, 1879, was the second largest city on the West Coast. Not just California, but the entire Western coast, Western states of the United States. There was San Francisco, then Sacramento. We were the headquarters for the newest high technology industry in the country, the Central Pacific Railroad and the Western terminus of that railroad. So we felt like that role as one of the major cities on the West Coast was guaranteed. Uh, in both cases, both the optimism of Sacramento and the optimism of Sacramento's black community turned out to be a little too high. Just to show you geographically, the city of Sacramento was the original city grid from what's now Alhambra Boulevard and Broadway 
to the Sacramento River, and uh, there was not yet uh, the, the new Central Pacific Railroad along B Street. And you can see by these dots the distribution of the African American population in the city. Now, 1879, Sacramento's population was 21,000 people. Second biggest city on the West Coast, 21,000 people. That's about two thirds of what are in the Central City grid today. The black population of Sacramento was about 400, so about 2% of the city are black. And so you can see roughly where the dots are. The concentration is between the river and 10th Street and the brand new California State Capitol, which has just been completed a few years earlier. But there are a few dots farther out into what's rapidly becoming a new suburb facilitated by mule-drawn streetcars. Uh, this is Clarissa Hundley Wildly, Wildy at age five. Her family arrived here in the 1870s, and I wanted to share, uh, this is from Clarence's master's thesis, uh, what her family, the Ray family, encountered when they came to Sacramento. Ow, out for Sacramento! As his family alighted from the train, Francis Ray looked around the depot. There were a few people, obviously come to meet travelers on that train. Greetings were heard with murmurs of conversation and laughter. Francis looked for a black face. Finally, he saw a sweeper and quickly made his way over to him. I'd be much obliged if you could tell me where I might put my family up for the night. I'm looking for a family here and I'll need to get settled before I start looking for them. The man put aside his broom and peered at Francis quizzically. Well, where are y'all from? We just got in from Texas, replied Francis. Can you help me? I'm almost through with this job today, so wait till it finishes, and I'll see what I can do, said the man. The sweeper, whose name was Ben Collins, took the Ray family in this home until they made contact with Francis's long-lost parents, who lived in Sacramento. And upon seeing his parents once again, Francis decided to stay and raise his family. The rest of the, his, this account deals with the family's experience adjusting to and living in the Sacramento of what Clarence Caesar called the settled years. And these photos that you're seeing are from the Clarice and Hundred Hundred Wildly collection at the Center for Sacramento History. Just a, a glimpse of life in the black community. And the reason why Clarence chose the settled years is partially because it was establishment and settlement of what had been a very wild and woolly gold rush community into a city and a city with its own traditions and families and societies within societies and in some cases settled because the black community proportionally shrank between 1880 and about 1910 the population of african americans only grew to about 486 now in 1910 the population of the city was 44,000 so they're one percent of the population of the city of sacramento the chinese population was 1,500. It actually dropped since the gold rush. And the Japanese population, 3,800. The Chinese and Japanese communities were both living in the same part of the city, what was later called the West End. And so the African-American community was very small, very lacking in political power, and feeling kind of on the edge, despite the fact that they scored these earlier victories. They don't feel like they have a lot of allies or a lot of friends in Sacramento or in general. And for many, the, the key to success seemed to be invisibility. We're just gonna get by, try not to be noticed. The, the Grubbs house that you see here, this is at 26th and S Street in um, the Newton Booth neighborhood. You should be able to see the mouse there. This building's still standing. It's one of the, a handful of uh, early, I guess you saw pioneer black family homes in Sacramento. There's a few others. These, are, these gentlemen are all members of the Inman family. Now, for the, the rest of Sacramento, one of the first changes of fortune happened when the four founders of the Central Pacific Railroad all left Sacramento and they took their railroad headquarters with them. We styled the Southern Pacific shops, but Southern Pacific headquarters, Southern, it's, it's the same company. Central Pacific essentially became Southern Pacific and their railroad network expanded as well as their wealth. And they all moved to the Bay Area, except for Collis Huntington on the right who moved to New York City, leaving Sacramento behind. And many Sacramentans felt abandoned by this, especially the white 
upper class of Sacramento, most of whom were uh, merchants and uh, considered themselves farmers. Even if they didn't necessarily till the soil themselves, farming was an assumed career. Now, when Central Pacific or Southern Pacific reached Los Angeles, there was a land boom. And before long, it became the second largest city in California, beating Sacramento. Then the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad reached Los Angeles, and LA grew even larger. AT and SF kept going north to Oakland, and Oakland became the third largest city in, Sacramento, in California, and Sacramento was bumped to fourth place. We saw our position shrinking, and we weren't quite sure why. Now, the response of white Sacramento was, well, we need our own second railroad. And they actually got one, the Western Pacific Railroad. A lot of you will recognize this building as the old spaghetti factory day for today. But that was Western Pacific's passenger depot. Rather than being located downtown or combining into a union station as other cities did, Western Pacific had an entirely different station two miles away. And it almost felt like the middle class of Sacramento is moving farther and farther from the waterfront, where the African American community, the Japanese community, the Chinese community, other immigrant communities, uh, European immigrant communities like the Portuguese and Italians were all settling in. But the, the bourgeois were moving inland and they had their own railroad station two miles from the waterfront to serve the needs of the middle class rather than urban Sacramento. This is also the era of the canonization of John Sutter. Now, Sutter had arrived in 1839 uh, with the uh, Mexican land grant that he received, quickly dominated the Nisanon and turned them into his combination workforce and army for all practical purposes, slaves. And because he lost all of that, he wasn't really, you know, he was considered just kind of a respected figure, you know, oh, hey, John, he's a good guy or whatever. And they, they, after, after he had been catapulted from power through the acquisition of California by the United States and the acquisition of his land by speculators. But he became something else in the 1890s during this period of, uh, I guess you could call it economic anxiety for Sacramento's middle class. They needed a symbol, a figure for the, the lost glory that was theirs. And Sutter became that figure. Instead of the uh, second rate con man who uh, bullied the Indian tribes into doing what he wanted, he was now the, the benevolent agriculturalist. And they reconstructed Sutter's Fort into a park and museum to share this new mythology that in many ways, it's comparable to Civil War memories of the antebellum South, where instead of the realities of slavery and the cotton economy, people preferred to remember, oh, the wonderful things about the plantation, oh, the slaves were so happy, which were all, of course, blatant lies, but blatant lies to serve a purpose. The purpose served here was separation of Sacramento as agricultural hub from Sacramento as industrial hub since the industrialists had left and took the money with them, leaving heavy industry, which were making the waterfront a more polluted and crowded place, and these waves of immigrants, which while useful to Sacramento's planter class as workers were less welcome in their neighborhood. This movement paralleled what was called the progressive movement, which was an evolution of the Republican Party interested in social progress in various forms. And Hiram Johnson, a Sacramento native, is closely associated with California progressivism. And they did a lot of things. They were instrumental of uh, getting women the vote, some of the first environmental laws, uh, antitrust laws, and first the first limitations on big business but they were also associated with eugenics and with, uh, with racial laws. Uh, Southern progressives were fairly involved in uh, a lot of the early Jim Crow laws and a lot of uh, land use laws, such as racial exclusion covenants. We'll talk about more of those late, later. 
And Sacramento's progressives cast their eye and what they said, well, why, why are we losing all this stuff? What, what is it about Sacramento that's turning people away and, and stopping us from growth? Oh, it's, it's the tenderloin. Now that's what the neighborhood downtown principally along L street and second street was called in the uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries is the tenderloin. And yeah, there's a tenderloin in San Francisco. Both were named after the tenderloin in New York city, partially because we had a lot of migrants from New York city who came both to Sacramento and San Francisco. And the principal feature of the tenderloin, at least in the public eye was that it was a zone of legalized sex work. These were common in American cities in the late 20th century. In Chicago, the, the levee is what the neighborhood is called. And there were notorious brothels and cribs and parlor houses of all sorts. Typically, these were adjacent to Chinese neighborhoods and African-American neighborhoods, just as in Sacramento. In New Orleans, Storyville, the Basin Street, uh, this was uh, what they called exactly the same neighborhood. And it also became, in many ways, a, a flourishing culture hub for new forms of music. Jazz was being invented, ragtime and jazz, uh, in American culture. These are African-American inventions, but they were arriving in popular culture via these really entertainment zones because they also had bars and dance clubs and restaurants and other forms of, of entertainment, uh, theaters, in addition to the obvious sex work uses of those neighborhoods. And they were generally perceived by white America as dens of vice and iniquity, which, yeah, I guess is the whole idea. But the assumption was that people who were tempted towards the marginal ends of these recreational centers, uh, towards the dance clubs, towards popular dance and drink and things like that, you would end up descending into uh, the, the life of the red light district, the life of the, the tenderloin, which was frequently fatal. Another priority of the progressives was limiting what was called white slavery, which was basically the idea that Sinister men, generally Southern or Eastern European, would seduce young white women into a life of prostitution and degradation and drug addiction and death. Now, that associate white and slavery explicitly says members of this movement really only care about what happens to white women who fall into this trap. Uh, the profession was obviously not limited to white women. Um, the West End was still a place where black bodies were sold, both for, for labor and, and for sex. Now the difference to today is that this was legal. When uh, a sex worker was arrested, their, their occupation was listed as prostitute, but the charge was something else. Um, in this case, uh, the woman that you see here is Ella Davis, and she was charged with vagrancy. Now, vagrancy was an all-purpose charge, which was used any time that someone was a place where an uh, officer of the law didn't want them to be. Um, this is Hazel Brooks. She was arrested for pet petty larceny. And one of the sad ironies of this period, and in a lot of cases, that many of the communities that I study is very often the only permanent record is their arrest record. The only photograph that we know of them is, is a mug book shot like this. Uh, and uh, these are available online via archive.org, Sacramento mug books. They're, they're pretty interesting reading. They're, they're uh, a unique look into our past, into people who otherwise weren't documented at all. And just, just the faces, some of them are really haunting. Some of them you really wonder, wonder what the story is behind how they got there in front of that camera. But let's turn back to some of the people that we discussed last time of a, a different social category. Uh, Captain Robert Fletcher, uh, American born, grew up in the Caribbean, came back to the United States to fight in the Civil War in the Navy, and arrived in Sacramento as a member and eventually captain of the Sacramento Zoo Ops. He made a career as a chiropodist, diseases of the feet, and as a private nurse. In one case, he was 
a private nurse is the personal attending nurse for California's lieutenant governor. He actually, his daughter, Maud Flood, took on the career after him, uh, carried, carried on his practice as a chiropractist. And um, I don't know whether or not Robert Fletcher's wife, uh, his first wife, whether she, uh, Emma, whether she died or they divorced, but in 1907, he remarried Anna Maida Fletcher, or uh, An Anna Maida Hires, who we did also discussed last time. Anna Maida and her sister were a singing duo performed around the country, operas talking about uh, African-American history and uh, the quest for freedom. And when her sister died, Anna Maida came back to Sacramento. She stopped performing other than singing in church and simply were referred to herself as Maida and uh, re retired to a, a relatively quiet life with Dr. Fletcher. Uh, Dr. Fletcher died in 1922, Maida in 1925. Well, this is Sarah Mildred Jones, and she was another person who we mentioned last time. She came to Sacramento in the 1870s to be a school teacher, and by 1893, she became the first African-American principal of the Fremont School. Uh, it's located, it was located at 24th and N Street where Clara is now. Not the same building, but the same school. And the petition that you see on the right is a petition signed by every school teacher in the Sacramento School District because there was an effort to have her removed from that position. And essentially this is just a, a little a taste of the respect and admiration that her colleagues and co-workers and her teachers had for Sarah Mildred Jones. We also discussed the two churches that were located in Sacramento. Uh, this is Siloam Baptist Church became Shiloh Baptist Church. They built their permanent edifice that was there until the 50s at 6th and O Street. And here's a photo from the Center for Sacramento History of the church choir at Shiloh Baptist. And then the first church, St. Andrew's African Methodist Episcopal, dating back to Daniel Blue in 1851, located at 7th and G Street. Today, there is a bronze plaque on the side of the county parking structure where this church once stood. And the church itself is relocated to 8th Street and Southside Park. And these two stained glass windows are still hanging in the windows of St. Andrew's AME today. Uh, this is Reverend J. Gordon McPherson, who published Sacramento's first black newspaper, Sacramento Forum. He only put out one issue, but McPherson had a pretty good legacy in Sacramento. He was known as a, as a extremely skilled orator. And uh, Sacramento culture at this time is within the African uh, no, sorry, within the African American community was very much influenced by the writings of Booker T. Washington who described black America as separate fingers on one hand. Uh, a policy, like I said, of, of invisibility. Uh, the, the idea is that the African American community in the United States was outnumbered, lacked in political power, and was threatened. And the best way to get along was simply to get along, rather than calling for revolutionary change or for a dramatic shift in power to prove how useful the black community could be as, as workers, as uh, members of society. And that was the, the message that was delivered by thinkers of this day. I have found reference to the one arrival, a, a talk by Booker T. Washington in Sacramento in a biography of a woman who grew up in Sacramento, but I haven't been able to find verification that it actually happened love to but i haven't seen it yet and the black community of sacramento did have a, a political voice that was reported on uh you can see here there's captain robert fletcher one of the delegates to the uh Afro afro-american republican convention in sacramento that endorsed governor party and carried out its uh, political duties there was beginning to be a split going on though within the republican party between faction one faction called the black and tan faction 
which was the faction that advocated for African American rights within the Republican Party. The other faction was called the Lily Whites. And well, guess who they represented? Uh, they wanted to attract Southern voters and Southern whites wouldn't join a party that had black members. And so there was an active movement at this point about between about 1910 and 1920, mostly in the South, but to remove black presence from the Republican party and essentially disenfranchise the, the voters that had been there and the in many ways one of the symbols of the Republican party's image since its inception, because uh, in an age of increasing racism, uh, the whites who were increasingly racist wanted to shed that image. Now this is uh, on the right, this is a, a page from the Western Review. John M. Collins was the editor and uh, McPherson, as well as Robert Fletcher, uh, the, the actually uh, Collins and Robert Fletcher both worked for Reverend McPherson on his paper. And Collins started his own paper a few years later. Uh, Reverend Collins was another uh, black preacher in Sacramento. And another professional who embodied in many ways the same kind of spirit as Booker T. Washington was P.J. Clyde Randall, who was an attorney, a uh, practicing black attorney in Sacramento. I don't know if he actually heard cases here, but he lived here for a couple of years. He was a veteran of the Spanish-American War. And he started his own paper, the second African-American paper in the city, and also wrote editorials for the Sacramento Union. And this list is a list of Sacramento's early black businesses. And for the most part, these are relatively low-level businesses, laundry, barbershops, shaving parlors, shoe shine stands, smally parlors. But... He demonstrated it as a beginning. This is the start of something. And the, uh, he played up the, the fact that black workers were working in Sacramento's industries, were doing a good job. He didn't stay in Sacramento very long. He ended up moving to, to the Bay Area as well, but he did leave, have some impact as far as helping to characterize and categorize these places. And he did have one fiery oration that he gave when, uh, and a veterans organization put on a reunion for veterans of the uh, Spanish-American War and the Civil War, and they segregated it. He was really, really livid at the fact that, uh, okay, veterans of the Civil War, union veterans of the Civil War, and you're going to segregate it? What's the deal? Uh, so... Even even though, like I said, generally we're talking about what's described as the settled period, and even the leaders of the black community are trying very much to not rock the boat, occasionally the boat needs to get rocked. And on this list, there's a few names that are unusual, and historians love unusual names because it, Smith, Jones, Fong, common names, it's hard to look up because there's so many people with the same last name. But when you see somebody with an unusual name, you go, maybe they, maybe they might be either, e easier to find. There's a couple here that I was able to find, uh, a few that we'll talk about later. Um, there's a tamale parlor here. This is W.H. Gwynn's tamale parlor. And you can see genuine Mexican tamales. It's right next to a Chinese laundry. And you can see they grow corn right in their front yard to make the tamales. So it's about as authentic as you can get, I guess, or as genuine as you can get. Uh, the other name that really struck me was Masmezu. Now, where does the name Masmezu come from? And it turns out uh, that the name Masmezu comes from the first Japanese settlement in the United States in Placer County called the Wakamatsu Tea and Silk Colony. It was an unsuccessful experiment, very brief, about 1869 to 1871. But this experiment, the idea was they wanted to move Japanese farmers to California, and including some samurai from the from the, the same region where they come from in Japan, and start a silk farm and grow plants for tea. And a couple of them stayed in California. One was a gentleman named Kaninosuke Masumizu, and he married Carrie Wilson, who was a uh, black and native American woman from Coloma. And their child was Harry, 
and he read his name was uh, changed to Masmedzu. I guess they felt like that would be more pronounceable. But that's Harry Masmedzu, who stayed, stayed, stayed in California. So that's a very early link between the earliest Japanese settlement in the United States and Sacramento's African American community. I just thought it was kind of neat that his name turned up on that list. Here's another letter from, Ch from P.J. Clyde Randall. It's from 18, 1917, but he's writing Theodore Roosevelt to let, let him know that, uh, hey, uh, there's going to be a black division or brigade in the army that'll be part of World War I. And yeah, no, Roosevelt isn't president anymore, but he's still an important figure that, you know, hey, I want to I wanna command. So like I said, Randall's an interesting guy. Now, the, the Klansman is better known as Birth of a Nation, after the movie, but it was a play that was essentially it was a recruitment video for the reborn Ku Klux Klan. And it was pretty controversial in its day. Uh, it actually spurred riots in some cases because if, if you've seen, there's essentially there are um, white women who were accosted by black men in, in the film and that its portrayal in a film was used by justification for lynching uh, by, by white crowds who left and were all mad and wanted to, to get even with what they'd just seen on the screen or even in play form. And so Sacramento's black community was a little upset about it, a little concerned about this. In 1908, there was discussion, but not action about submitting some kind of protest to the city of Sacramento saying, don't let this play be shown here. It's going to be hard, harmful to us. It's, it, it's a risk. But they didn't act. In 1911, the play came through again, this time at a larger theater. And Reverend R.H. Herring of St. Andrews met with Mayor Beard at the time and asked, please don't show this play. And Mayor Beard said, you know, it's, it's fine. We're not going to, we're not going to stop them from doing it. But he acknowledged that Okay, I can see why you don't like this, but we're not going to do anything about it. 1915, and instead of a play, this time it's a movie, the new technological marvel of the ages uh, on the silver screen, G.W. Uh, Griffith's Birth of a Nation. And this time, the black community has much more organization for various reasons we're going to we're talk about shortly. But... Instead of one representative, 24 members of Sacramento's black community showed up in Ed Carragher's office. That's Ed Carragher on the left. He was a member of the, he was a, a, originally part of the, the earlier strong mayor city government that was dissolved in 1911. And then he became part of the um, board of trustees from 1911 and 1920. He was a survivor. And, but, and he also had, because he was an innkeeper who worked in the West End, uh, he had the, the Saddle Rock bar, he knew a lot of the black community and had at least a little bit of sympathy. And so, so what he, this compromise that he worked out was that we're still going to show the film, but there's, I know there's some objectionable scenes. We're going to edit those out. So that's a small victory, but it's something. And that's in a lot of ways. That's the way that I would sum up a lot of this era is small victories or something and small victories plus survival means potential for greater victories in the future. I think that's in a lot of that's how I interpret that era, both from what I see, what I read, and even what I see the writers from that community, or the people of that community writing about it, and what they have to say. Now, Sacramento is growing geographically. Between 1910 and 1920, we went from 44,000 to 65,000. Not necessarily because people were still cramming into the central city grid, but because we annexed two nearby or three nearby suburbs, East Sacramento, right around here, Curtis, what's now Curtis Park and Land Park, right around here, and Oak Park. And it was Oak Park that won annexation because it, it was more of a middle class neighborhood and it was had more population. It was a streetcar suburb. It was reached by electric streetcars, originally battery powered, and then by trolley wire. And it was established before the creation of what were called racial exclusion covenants. So from its very earliest days, there were communities of color in Oak Park. This is um, Ernesto Galarza, who grew up in Sacramento, 
later became a labor activist, but this is from uh, his place in Oak Park or from his family's house. And another very well known in Sacramento uh, uh, is a figure is George Dunlap. He was born in Sacramento. His father had been a Sacramento Zouave and George from a very early age was a cook. He cooked for his family. He dropped out of school about third or fourth grade, uh, spent uh, his time working in nearby vegetable distributors, worked for a Chinese vegetable distributor just south of downtown and spent a lot of time in kitchens. And so he was maybe fated he was gonna end up a restaurateur. He worked for Southern Pacific in their dining cars and also in their private cars. He actually got arrested in February of 1919 for smuggling whiskey from California into Washington, where, which was a dry state. This was before prohibition had gone nationwide, but some states didn't allow alcohol and Washington was one of them. He was acquitted because the arraignment papers said that he had tried to smuggle alcohol into Oregon and that was legal. But it was the end of his career for Southern Pacific. And what he did when he left Southern Pacific employee was he got a contract for Sacramento Northern Railway, which is an electric railroad that went from Chico to Sacramento to Oakland. And he worked, he had their dining cars and also their, um, this uh, little ferry that went across Sassoon Bay, he managed all of their dining car service for the whole railroad. And he also, for a while, I, the, the, in the earlier slide, there was a picture of the Capitol Hotel at 7th and K Street. But by 1930, he'd lost the dining car contract, but he had a house in Oak Park. So he had purchased land in 1906 when it was still mostly strawberry fields. And so he had, he had a home, he had, he had a, a nearby contract where, uh, during the state fair, but for his day-to-day -day restaurant, he said, you know, I've got this wonderful house. I've got these wonderful daughters to work as my wait staff. So that started Dunlap's Dining Room. And that became one of the most legendary restaurant establishments in Sacramento history. He achieved success primarily by pursuing white customers, which meant in many cases, uh, to be perfectly honest, discouraging black customers. It's not that they weren't welcome at all, but they weren't as welcome often as they could have been. And they were very often, the, from what reports I've seen, there was one night a week when communities of color were welcome to attend, and the rest of the week the customers were mostly white. But it's what made his restaurant a success, is that adaptation to conditions, uh, the condition was Sacramento is 1% black. So if you're gonna succeed as a business person, you really need to diversify your portfolio. Uh, now, in terms of restaurant discrimination, uh, another Oak Park figure was Reverend T. Allen Harvey. He came to Sacramento in 1916, and uh, he was originally a pastor at AME Zion. He was the founder of Sacramento's NAACP chapter in 1916. And in 1918, he won the first anti-discrimination lawsuit in Sacramento history when he was refused service at the Bigelow restaurant at 3,835th Street in Oak Park. He uh, started his own church, Kyle's Temple AME Zion, in uh, first in, it founded in 1917, and then he opened the church in Oak Park, which is the first African American church outside of the old city grid in 1919. And that same year, he ran for city council. He was the first black candidate in Sacramento. And he did not win. He placed fourth out of a field of seven. And that was the way that he, he put it is that, you know, I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to win, but at the very least, I'm not going to place last. And he was correct about that. I'm going to read you a bit from his candidate statement because it talks a little political. It's a little, uh, well, okay, he's a politician. He wants to be a politician, so it's going to be a little political. Uh, Reverend Harvey first expressed an interest in running for city commissioner, this is a commission system, as I said, in March 1919 as a candidate for commissioner of public works. His platform included a comprehensive franchise for local streetcar companies, uh, a competitive franchise, and a reservoir-based water treatment system. He also took a position on saloons, reinforcing the idea of black progressivism, tempered tolerance for the saloon interest, as quoted in the Sacramento Union. Everyone knows how I stand on saloons. Nevertheless, I believe in the saloon man being given a fair deal. I'm not catering to the church vote to the exclusion of others. I want the support of all fair thinking men and believe that when the votes are counted, I shall not stand at the bottom of the list of seven. 
Now note, he said fair thinking men, women were also voting, already voting by then, but hey. Um, and I, I was at San Juan Hill with Colonel Roosevelt, he said. Uh, when those Spanish bullets were zipping around, we were all Americans. It should be the same today. So uh, like the Reverend we talked about earlier, uh, another military veteran. And that military service also became part of his legacy when in 1917, uh, Reverend Harvey spoke to a group of African-American men who were going off to fight in the First World War. He also spoke to a different group in 1919 after the war. And in 1919, the summer of 1919, it's called the Red Summer because there was a lot of a bloody conflict and a lot of, of a, a lot of lynching going on, essentially race-based conflict uh, by whites against blacks. And so his response was, let's start the Crispus Attucks Soldiers and Sailors Club, which, like the Sacramento Zouabs 50 years earlier, was intended as a self-defense force, the kind of like 50 years after this, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. So this was a community saying, we're under attack. Uh, to a certain extent, we can try to remain invisible. We can try to avoid rocking the boat, but sometimes the boat needs rocking. Sometimes we have to stand up. And that's, that's what Reverend Harvey did, both his, his political campaign, his refusal to be denied service, uh, and to be honest, an, an effort to create a, a paramilitary force to protect Sacramento's black community should have become necessary. Thankfully, it did not. Even... In 1922, when Sacramento's brand new Ku Klux Klan came to his church uh, and repainted it, they didn't vandalize it, they didn't burn it, they painted it. Sacramento's Ku Klux Klan was weird. Also based in Oak Park, um, and not very good on security. There was. The Sacramento Bee had a reporter stationed outside who reported the names of everybody who came in and out, and the Bee published them all. The McClatchy family, while they had their own racial skeletons in the closet, they were Irish Catholics, and the Irish Catholics were very much unloved by the Ku Klux Klan and vice versa. So they were not very tolerant of the Klan and reported them, uh, essentially outed them, and the city manager at the time fired every Klansman who uh, turned out to be a city employee. Now, most of the people that we've talked about so far, members of the black community who were an attorney, a doctor, uh, the heads of churches, uh, school principals, respected members of the community, but not everybody who was a black activist in Sacramento were respected members of the community, but we're pretty, there's some pretty amazing people who, who fall outside that category, and the next two people I'm gonna talk about are definitely there. This is the only photo I was able to find uh, in all my research. Maybe there's one, another one out there, but I haven't been able to find it yet, of Grant Cross, also known as Skewball. Uh, Grant Cross was born in uh, 1873 in Illinois. His family were from Alabama. They uh, had, come, had left slavery in Alabama after the Civil War, moved to Chicago. And they came to California via Kansas, spent a while in San Joaquin County, and lived in Red Bluff around the turn of the century. And the first reference I found to Grant Cross was from the Red Bluff paper in 1901, the summer. It was a, a foot race to relieve the monotony. Red Bluff, then as now, was hot and not very exciting. So they ran a four, he, he ran a four block foot race and won. The next article about Grant Cross was that he had uh, met and married a young woman named Rose Howell, and they moved to the big city of Sacramento, which is the largest major city to Red Bluff. And it was here in Sacramento that he met William Snow. And while Grant Cross is about five, six, outgoing, energetic, uh, William Snow strikes me as a little more of a strong, quiet type. Five foot ten, professional gambler, born in Fort Worth, Texas, in around 1865 to 1870, so a few years older than Grant. And the two of them in 1910 
created a new organization called the Frederick Douglass Improvement Club. And the way that William Snow described this is essentially it was a, a Sutter Club for black men. Now the Sutter Club, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, was another product of that period in the 1880s and 90s, sort of that anxiety producing period in Sacramento when they were worried about how, how is Sacramento gonna prosper and flourish? And it was started as a private club uh, that in the early 20th century was still exclusively white. And so Cross and Snow, wanting to have the access to the same opportunities as white Sacramento to, within their own with their own their own paradigm said well let's start a group that does the same sort of things and one of the things that those clubs did whether it was the the Elks or the Masons or the Sutter Club is get together and drink socially and gamble the the Elks if any of you are familiar with the Elks lodges the Elks were started basically as a way around New York Sunday game Sunday drinking laws and the uh, way around gambling laws because hey it's a private club our club members can drink here and this meant that the west end club hoping for essentially the same treatment as any other club turned out to be an unrealistic expectation sacramento police frequently hassled events of the west end club for gambling drinking assorted carryings on exactly the same thing that the white clubs are doing but they didn't let it stop them from engaging in civic events. They were very active in athletic events, in uh, foot races, in baseball, and boxing. They had a number of different clubs. Uh, their first location was the, the it's, it, by the time this photo was taken, it was the Reno Cafe, but this is 209 L Street, directly underneath Interstate 5 right now but that was one of their first clubhouses. And behind it was a absolutely legendary and notorious place called the Art Dance Hall, which later became the, uh, the L Street Arena of Boxing. We'll show a photo of it later. They lost that spot and moved into Sarah Hall, which was a former Presbyterian church at 6th and L Street. And Sarah Hall was also called Yugoslav Hall because a lot of Sacramento's Yugoslavian community also lived in the same neighborhood and interacted there. And that actually, this also got some grief from the city of Sacramento because the another thing that Cross and Snow are moving into is bringing this new music that was coming out of San Francisco and from the American South to San Francisco to the black community there. Uh, they didn't really have a name yet. It was starting to get called jazz in some cases or jazz. and um, it was pretty cool and it was very edgy, very new. And so they got to the point where, where white Sacramento young, young white people said, this is really neat. I want to go listen to this. I want to go dance to this, including white women. And that immediately became a problem for Sacramento's powers that were because interracial dancing was very much forbidden. And so while they had a few events and, and, and for a while were active at, at the Uslav Hall, at Sarah Hall. They lost that, that spot. Um, one thing about the definition of white women, um, Yugoslavian immigrants uh, like Catherine Nisetic, or Nisetic, I'm sorry, I learned how to pronounce her name a while ago. Brother, uh, her brother, Butch Nisetic, had actually been arrested with Grant Cross for gambling in Sarah Hall a couple of years earlier. But these... The, the women that we're talking about here, for the most part, especially Yugoslavian, Portuguese, Italian, uh, would not have been considered white if they walked into a meeting of the Tuesday Club. Uh, they wouldn't have been white if they walked into, the, the, into City Hall or the Center Club. But they were immediately considered white when they walked into a, a, a black dance. And that's one of the kind of a transition from immigrants to white that was made by many of these immigrant communities was a, a racist reaction or a racial reaction. Uh, Kitty Nesetic, I, I write her about, about her, in her in my book. She had a very, very complex love life, life and a tragic death. And her brother went on to be one of the city's most legendary gamblers who obviously, like I said, knew skewball. Uh, another white friend of William Snow and Grant Cross was John Creighton Churchill. 
who was, a, per newspaper accounts, a professor. Uh, they don't specify whether it was he was a college professor or professor was a common term for people who played piano and brothels. But John Creighton Churchill owned Churchill Dance Hall. And this was on 5th and M Street, so right in the middle of what's now Capitol Mall. And it was both his family home and a dance club. And it was also a polling place. And it was another of the West End Club's meeting places that received eternal, uh, official criticism, including from the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Now, one of the, I mean, most interesting, maybe even difficult to read articles about the West End Club that I found is from the Sacramento Union from the summer of 1914, when uh, about the West End Club inviting local political candidates to their meeting in order to hear them out, and hopefully secure their support. And the paper, the newspaper account was, it did not take this group seriously at all. It described their, the music, music they were playing as this horrible cacophony and said that, oh, the, the, the black men there were basically just grabbing all the food and free beer that they could they could grab and promising every candidate they'd vote for them. Really playing into every stereotype you could possibly name. But there's another lens to look at this, and that's through the, the lens of political necessity and political need. The traditional dance hall was a polling place, and the Women's Christian Temperance Union was saying, this is not an appropriate place for a polling place. But if this neighborhood the the tenderloin the the part the lower part of the city as it was also called lost their polling place that meant that the african american community would have to leave their neighborhood and walk into a white neighborhood where they're very much not welcome in order to vote any other communities of color that were going to vote would have to go to a white neighborhood in order to vote we're seeing the same sort of uh, strategy repeated today by making it harder to vote, you disenfranchise people because you, because you increase their risk. So they were asking not just for consideration, but for the franchise to continue self-advocacy. And what I talk about a little bit is the idea of black progressivism. William Snow and Grant Cross had been members of the Republican Party. For a while, they were members of the Progressive Party, which is an offshoot of the Republicans, despite the fact that the Republican Party is trying to shake off their black voters as much as possible, till the, the, the point a couple years later when actually Grant Cross re-registers as a Democrat. Not quite sure why, but it sounds like maybe they were getting a little sick of the Republican Party saying, well, you know, we don't want to represent you anymore. And the Churchill Dance Hall, again, was, was lost. And part of this is essentially that Mr. Churchill was white and he probably saw his own investment at risk. And while he was willing to be an ally and a friend to Grant Cross and William Snow and a friend to the West End Club, it was still, it was still a white owned building that he was only willing to go so far. So they found uh, another location because this was a Japan town. Like I said, about by, by the 1920s, there's close to 5,000 Japanese American members of that community and so 10 times the size of the black community and this theater the nippon theater had what had been previously a japanese operated boarding house and gambling hall upstairs and around 1915 it was taken over by grant cross and william snow as the eureka club which was one of the west end club's most enduring hangouts and they apparently like they got along pretty well with the owner of the theater, Yusuke Nishio, who in addition to operating the Nippon Theater also opened a restaurant called Wakano Ura. And some of you, if, if you ever go down 10th Street, 10th and W, there's actually a neon sign for Wakano Ura still there at the, the restaurant's last location. It had been sold to another family by the 1950s, but Yusuke Nishio was the founder of it. And it's got a great story about uh, that restaurant in the book as well. But he played host to, to this uh, club as long as he owned the theater, which is really until just about the, the eve of World War II and his family's internment. And this is a view down 2nd Street because see here's the Nippon Theater on the left and then the Southern Pacific Waterfront, the far end. Um, one of the far reaching effects of the West End Club was that it renamed the neighborhood. It's another one where it's kind of hard to connect the dots, but before 
the West End Club existed, nobody called this part of the, the city the West End. And then from about the 19 teens on, people do start calling it the West End Club, the, the West End. And by the 1950s, that's all they call it. They were active in, in civic events and in sporting events. This is the uh, L Street Arena of Boxing that I mentioned. Uh, because a boxing room is one of the places where uh, uh, where uh, a black athlete could compete with a white athlete on his own merits and on his own uh, on his own strengths, and so athletics were emphasized as okay, that's an acceptable route. We'll take it. Um, but they their effects are unknown. They they were hidden. Nobody seem to know about this because nobody talked about the West End when I was growing up in Sacramento or when most of us were, but it had these hidden effects. And that's what I want to show is, is a little more of in this talk or any other. Um, William Snow, uh, one other incident about William Snow I want to discuss is in 1915, shortly after they took over the space at 327 L Street, uh, 4th and L, where, where they, the Nippon Theater was was um, just an example of his level of cool uh, is uh, patrons started throwing pool balls at people. There was a, there was a pool table. He started chucking balls at people and, uh, and attacking them, basically. And he wound up to throw one at, at Snow, and uh, Snow just pulled a pistol, pow, shot him in the arm. And he was arrested for it. And that's the only reason we have a photo of William Snow is because of that mug book shot, as I mentioned. And as it turned out, the guy he shot didn't even press charges because it did successfully disarm the situation. But it's a, it's a measure of, of his patience, I think. Uh, now, William Snow died in September of 1921 of pneumonia. And he left an estate of around $3,000 in cash and jewels and a Cadillac, a uh, total of about $7,000. So he actually did, again, within his context, uh, pretty well as, as a business person, as a gambler, uh, as, and as an organizer, because he was all of those things. Uh, the, in the following year, 1923, Grant Cross purchased a home for himself and his, his wife and uh, Rose and his kids, uh, a small little place, only about 600, 600 square feet on 22nd Street between I and J Street. It's still there today. It's a cute little bungalow with a hip roof and a little porch out in front. And um, I'm still trying to find out more about the history of that building. I think it might be potentially a, a, a rather modest but unique city landmark because it's the only building directly associated with the West End Club that still survives today. And uh, also in 1923, uh, Grant Cross made another kind of a splash as he and a bunch of his friends talked their way into a film production of Cameo Kirby. In this era, there was a new fad of riverboat films. Okay, we talked a little bit about, yes, uh, this was an era of ascending racism and the return of the Ku Klux Klan and segregation and Jim Crow. Uh, but part of it was, was that sentimental mythology of the South. And as a result, there was a demand for movies about the South. But it was hard for people in Hollywood to get all the way to the Mississippi River. But Sacramento, we had a river, we had riverboats, we had a workforce, and notoriously lax laws against prohibition um and because partially maybe because we had business people like uh like grant cross who was pri principally employed as a, a bartender and a waiter and uh, was very involved with a lot of those alcohol serving businesses and he was able to talk his way in and then become part of this production to get his friends jobs and to start maybe to establish a, a new economic enterprise within the black community working in the film industry Unfortunately, it was short-lived. In January of 1924, he was institutionalized in Stockton Mental Hospital, uh, supposedly because of alcoholic psychosis and hallucinations. He died there over six years later on October 20th, 1930. I would love to know why he was hospitalized, whether it was um, his own, uh, whether it was an organic brain injury or illness or frustration, the loss of... Uh, it, it it's it's hazardous to guess but it's a it's a secret that might never be told but i'd love to know because he he vanished from the scene in sacramento it was not even mentioned in the newspaper despite the fact that he was such such a well-known figure that, i mean look at this he's in the movies now and this is in the sacramento b and the assumption is that everybody knows who this guy is in 1923 in 1924 he's vanished 
but the institution he created did. In addition to the fact, like I said, the, the, the West End really got named after that club. The Eureka Club at 326 and a half L Street continued as a jazz club under their successor, Charles Derrick. He was hired as a manager there in 1922, and Derrick continued running the Eureka Club, became one of the best known and, and most reputable jazz clubs on the West Coast, and at least inland from San Francisco. And he was still running it in about in the early 1940s when he renamed it the Jitterbug Cafe. But by the early 1940s, the world was changing again. And the, I, the small, mostly insular black community of California was met with what was, was one of the several great migrations of African-Americans. The earlier black migrations that happened in California mostly went towards Southern California. Really very few came to Sacramento or to the Bay Area. And that all changed with the Second World War. And we're gonna talk about that next time in a segment focusing on what I call the Sacramento Renaissance. Uh, these are some of my books. They are available for sale at Capital Books. You can either go there to at 1011 K Street and buy them in person, or you can order them online. They're also available at Time Tested Books on 21st Street. You can order them from the publisher, or you know, if you really need to from Amazon, but it's, you know, it's more fun to buy it from a local bookstore. Um, I will now open it up to questions. There's a few. Uh, Heather Langtot, asked if there was a coroner's report for Grant Cross in San Joaquin County, and that we might be able to learn something there. Um, I don't know yet. He was buried actually in the hospital grounds. But one thing I was able to get is duplicate copies of, um, this is Grant, a duplicate copy of Grant Cross's death certificate. So we know the cause of death, which was listed as general paralysis of the insane. But I do not know if there was an autopsy or other, uh, other sorts of investigation done beyond that. And the, the hospital doesn't exist anymore and the only records are microfilm in the state library. And I was able to find the date of his admission and the reasons for his admission, but no records beyond that, at least not yet. Uh, I also got William Snows, he died here in Sacramento. Um, okay, I've, I've got one hand up, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, Go ahead and uh, you're, you're live. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I am wondering about the Capitol Amtrak mural from about 1926 um, because it seems pretty exceptionally racist um, towards Chinese and African Americans and what you think about the fact that they refurbished it in 2015. Okay, well, the, the mural that you're talking about, there was, it's of the groundbreaking. Yes. And at the time, uh, this was before the, the Chinese workforce had been hired, so there wouldn't necessarily have been any chi Chinese workers there. And Sacramento's black uh, population was small. So, yes, it, it, it does exclude um, people of color. Well, actually, there are a couple of them. Oh. Um, they're just on the side kneeling down. There are okay. Chinese people wearing the standard hat with the long braids and a couple of African Americans, but they're all kind of crouching on the sidelines, which was what um, okay. affected me about it. Okay, kind of, you know, sort of off to the side and that kind of sort of the, 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 the beatific, oh, look at the, the great white man up on the stand. Exactly, There's, and yeah. the event never happened. It yeah, was... This, yeah. recreated yeah it was a, a january in sacramento would not have been a, a blue uh cloud the sky and theodore Jur judah certainly wouldn't have been there yeah <laughs> yeah so so yeah it's it's in in many ways it, yeah now that you mention it um that's another fantasy it's a it's a, a myth created to propagate the, the importance of that event um, as a piece of artwork, it, it is what it is, and it was restored because it was uh, it, it, because it was a it, in it's on the wall, and was relatively well preserved. But there's there's maybe a story to be told about what didn't ha you know what what happened on that what what's you, you see on that mural and what actually happened in January of 1862. So okay, 
yeah. So that, thank um, you. That's good. That's a. It is a good question, and thank you, thank you for for pointing that out because as as you just heard, I think I put those parts out of my mind. So thank you for putting me back in there. Thank you for answering. Okay, let's see. Okay, this is this is going to be the the video is going to be posted on Facebook and uh, on the the West End Club Facebook page uh, as well as the the next event, which will take place uh, unless something changes radically two weeks from today. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you still have a question or? Oh, no, I'm good. You can mute me. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for being here today. Uh, this is an experiment. It's just kind of something I'm doing on my own. And so if there are other ideas or areas of interest, uh, please let me know. Um, Generally, I've been using things I've already written to write, <laughs> to, to put these on, so I'm not necessarily doing a lot of original research for them, but um, I'm always open to, to suggestions. And uh, I'm trying to tell the stories I think that need to be told. Uh, the way my wife puts it sometimes is dead people tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, tell about me. And uh, like I said, a, a lot of the people that, pretty much everyone that I talked about is someone who I went, wow, that person is, is neat. And why, why, don't, why don't we know more about that person? And in some cases, they're just these amazingly fascinating people that I'm, I'm glad I was able to hopefully help you get to know them a little bit. Um, yeah, it'll be, um, it, the Facebook live feed should start immediately. And um, if, if not, then I'm gonna be posting the video to YouTube in the next day or two. Uh, the first part is already on YouTube and, it was posted through the, the West End Club, and I'll post this one then as well. But thanks, everyone, for coming today. I'm going to end the recording of the meeting now, and, and I, I really appreciate your support, and hopefully uh, you'll buy the book and enjoy it.